Hi, this is Rafa Huja again. You can probably tell that we are in Toronto by uh, those hockey sticks lying in the hallway. Um, in this meeting room, looks like the meeting is just finished and Walid is uh, all alone, so maybe we can catch him for a few minutes. How are you doing, Walid? Good, how are you, Rafa? Pretty good. Do you mind if we uh, sit down for a few minutes and talk about uh, security? Sure, please come in. Great, thank you. So Wally is one of our uh, key architects when it comes to security in DB2. Uh, he's been... How, how long have you been with, uh, with the DB2 team? Uh, it's about 11 years now. Wow, so almost one of the original founders of the team, I guess. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so Wally, um, DB2 is already considered to be... Um, um, quite a secure data server um, in, in DB2 Viper or DB2 9. Um, there were um, several enhancements such as um, the LBAC capabilities. Um, in Viper 2, I guess, there are a lot more enhancements. Can you tell us what they are? Sure, yeah. So the, the enhancement that we have made in Viper 2 uh, address uh, two, 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 key, two key aspects. Uh, one is we wanted to help uh, our customer easily manage secu uh, security inside the database. Uh, so the, the database role features actually that, that, that does that. And the uh, second aspect is to help our customers to uh, in their efforts to comply with government regulations. So we have made enhancements to our auditing capability, for example. Uh, and we have also introduced a new capability called Trusted Contacts to address some of the challenges, some of the security challenges in the three-tier environments. Okay, sounds good. Um, now there's this concept of roles as well that has been introduced in Viper 2. Uh, can you tell us a bit about that? Sure. So uh, roles or database roles as we like to call them uh, are, you can think of a database role as an object that you create in the database and you can grant privileges and authorities to that role. And the idea behind database roles is to avoid having to grant privileges and authorities directly to users and instead try to grant them to roles and make roles, make, make users simply members in roles. And that way you can simplify the management of privileges in the database. So, for example, if you have an organization where you have developers, testers, managers, directors, and such, you could create roles in the database to sort of mimic that organization inside the database, and you would grant your privilege directly to those roles, and then you make people or users simply members in these roles. So, for example, if Joe is a developer, you just grant him membership in the role developer. So, when the next day Joe, you know, changes and becomes a manager, you don't have to go and revoke all his privileges that he had before and grant new privileges because he's now a manager. He has access to different tables, for example. All you have to do is to just take him out of the role developer and put him in the role manager. And it makes really the management of privileges in the database uh, much, much easier. The in other the past, uh, people have been using groups for this sort of a thing. How is this different from groups? That's a very good question. So conceptually, roles and groups can be thought of as the same thing. And they are both a way of putting a group, you know, a set of users in, 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 a, in, a, in a group or role. Uh, the key difference is that roles are, are managed inside the database, where groups are managed outside the database. And because they are managed outside of the database, they have some restrictions when it comes to using groups for the creation and management of certain database objects like views or materialized query tables or packages or triggers and such. So for these objects, because they depend on the privileges held by the creator, DB2 is not informed uh, when, for example, membership in a particular group has been revoked. So for that specific reason, DB2 does not consider privileges associated with groups for the creation of that type of object like views and uh, triggers and such. Roles are very different because they are managed inside the database, so they are considered for, for the creation of that type of object.
Okay, sounds good. Uh, I think the other thing you mentioned was uh, contacts or trusted contacts. Yes. How so, does that play? Okay, so trusted contacts is a new capability and it really addresses uh, two key problems. The first key problem is uh, occurs in three-tier environments. So uh, many of our customers develop three-tier applications. And three-tier applications have traditionally been developed such that the middle tier application talks to the DB2 database through a connection that has a generic ID. And that generic ID really just identifies that middle tier application to the database. So all the requests that are sent to the database, whether they are coming from the end users or they are really for the middle tier itself, at the database level, because the model uses a generic ID, if you look, the access control doesn't really know the difference. And the auditing also, if you look at the auditing, you wouldn't know whether this particular request is really something that was done by the mid-tier application for its own housekeeping, or is it done on behalf of some users. And that really makes complying with regulations quite challenging because you don't know who the end user is. So trusted contexts really address that problem in the sense that they allow you to establish a trust relationship between the database and some external application such as the middle tier application. And once that trust relationship is established, the authorization ID that established that trusted, con connect, uh, trusted connection can acquire additional capabilities. And one of these additional capabilities is the ability to change the current user on that trusted connection to a different user. So even though you initially established the connection as Bob, and now you want to do some SQL, for example, on behalf of Joe, you have a way of changing the connection so that DB2 knows that it's now Joe, and access control at the database level will be based on Joe, and auditing will be based on Joe. So it's, 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 a, it's a major security problem that is uh, addressed by trusted contacts, which is the use of the generic IDs by these three-tier applications. So I mentioned that there are two problems addressed by trusted context. That's what that was the first one. The second one is with respect to when privileges become available to a particular user. So traditionally it has been if you know the security administrator grants select on the payroll table to user uh, Bob, that privilege is available, you know, anytime. There can be situations where I don't want you to have access to that privilege only unless you are accessing the database from this specific IP address, for example. If you are not coming from this IP address, you don't have access to that privilege. So trusted contexts provide a mechanism where you can say, I'm gonna give you this role, and this role is available to you only and only if you are coming from this specific uh, IP address, for example. So it's a way of enforcing control on when a particular privilege can be uh, exercised by, by the user. Okay, sounds good. Sounds like a pretty powerful capability.